Romans chapter 3. And I will warn you in advance, we're going to read the entire chapter. Don't worry, some of y'all don't even read a whole chapter all week. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm sure you do. But as we read the chapter, I will ask you to pay close attention to the words and the verbs, uh, verbiage that is actually used. We're going to be talking about most of it. And uh, every word of God is pure. Amen? Amen? So as we read Romans chapter 3, I ask you if you would please stand with me. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 1. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness... Commend the righteousness of God. What shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather as we be slanderously reported, as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their li lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin." But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. If you would please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your book. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your law. Lord, we thank you that it shows us that we're sinners, and we also thank you most of all that it shows us that we have hope in Jesus Christ and in nothing else. Lord, I pray that today that you would help us to glorify your name in all that we say and do. I pray that we'd be edified. Lord, if there's somebody here who has never put their faith and trust in you as Savior, Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they'd trust you before it's eternally too late. Lord, we ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you would, please be seated. Romans chapter 3 is the chapter in the Bible that deals most explicitly about sin. It is about sin. If you ask, where can I find the gospel in the Bible? The book of Romans is the primary book where you find the gospel. The reason the book of Romans was written was so that Paul could tell the people in Rome what the gospel is. And essentially the gospel is this. It's that you're a sinner and you're going to be judged, and that judgment isn't going to go well. So you're going to die and go to hell. But, but, Jesus Christ 
God commendeth his love toward us and that while you're yet, we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans deals with the problem of sin. It deals with the, the remedy for sin, which is Jesus Christ. It's kind of odd the difference between Satan and God. You see, in Genesis chapter 3, Satan gets to open his mouth for the first time. And the first thing that he says is, Yea, yea, hath God said, which is yes. It's the affirmative. It is yes. When we get to the New Testament, we have some history books. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are narratives. But the first doctrinal book that we have in the New Testament is the book of Romans. And when we get to chapter 3, if you look at verses 10, 11, and 12, see chapters 1 and 2 is laying the framework. It's laying the foundation for Jews and Gentiles. Who's reprobate? Who's good? Who's evil? Who judges? We judge each other, and we're just as guilty as the people we judge. And then in chapter 3 is the first time that Paul actually starts dealing with the problem. He says, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. That's the indictment of the human race. Satan shows up. He says, yes, yay, it's all positive. God starts talking about doctrine of the condition of man, and he says, no, no, it's all negative, it's all bad. There's only one positive thing about you, only one positive thing, and that is that Christ died for you because you're so worthless you can't save yourself. And I mean that about me too. You say, what a horrible way to talk to people. I'm so worthless I can't save myself. The reason I'm standing before you today to talk about Jesus Christ is not because of anything that I have done or any goodness that I have. It's because Jesus Christ saved me when he didn't have to and I didn't deserve it. And that's the, that's the plight of every Christian. You know, if you look at, you ever saw a Ouija board? A Ouija board, you may not realize this, but if you look at the construct of the word, it is we... Yeah. It is the French word for yes, and it is the German word for yes. It's a yes, yes board. If the Bible starts off as a no, no, it is Satan, Satanism is all positivity with no balance. But godliness is the balance of sin that must be cured and must be remedied. We must understand the negative aspect first. You can't be saved until you're lost. You have to know that you're a sinner dying and on your way to hell before that you can trust Christ as your Savior. Jesus Christ is not just something that you add to a good life. It is something that transforms a horrible life. And that's all that it ever is. Negative, negative. There was a professor one time talking about linguistics. And he said, you know, in other languages, if you use a double negative, it turns, it's still a negative. You know, in English, if you use a double negative, it changes it into a positive. But in some other languages, if you use a double negative, it's still a negative. And then he went on to say that in the English language, you can never have a double negative that equals, a, a double positive that equals a negative. You can never say two good things that equal a negative. And somebody in the back of the room said, yeah, right. <laughs> Double positive came out to be a negative. <laughs> Which brings us to verse 4. Let God be true, but every man a liar. God be true, but every man a liar. That verse right there, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, that is the verse. If you're going to memorize one verse and take it with you everywhere you go, that's the one you need to know. You need to write that verse down, memorize that verse, and put it in your kit bag and take it with you everywhere you go. The one thing you need to understand about men, anybody you listen to, including me, is that every man at some point will tell you something that is not so. 
It doesn't mean they intend to. It doesn't necessarily mean they want to. But every man's a liar. There's only one, one entity that is not a liar. That is God Almighty. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. You, one day, are going to stand before God. If you're lost, you're going to stand before God, you're going to be judged for your sins, and you're going to be cast into hell. If you're saved, you're going to, be, you're going to stand before God, you're going to stand before Jesus Christ, and he's going to assess you for what you did in this life for him, what sort your work was. I want to tell you something about that judgment, Christian. Yeah, you're saved. Yeah, you're going to heaven. Yeah, you have a home in heaven. But when you stand before Jesus Christ and you have to give an account for how you lived your Christian life, you're going to be there by yourself. You are going to have to answer for how you live a Christian life. If you do something because Brother Kevin said it, that excuse isn't going to cut. Well, Jesus, you don't understand. Brother Kevin said da, 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 da. So what does my word say? Well, you don't understand, God. The Catholic priest said da, 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 da. The Baptist preacher said da, 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 da. The Methodist preacher said this and this and this. Who cares what they said? Every man's a liar. One thing some of our, uh, some of our professional religious brethren can't stand is that we still apply this to everybody. And you should as a Christian. You need to understand. I don't care how professional they are. I don't, how, I don't care how good, godly, and dedicated the Christian is. I don't care how long they've been saved. It's only a matter of time before something untrue comes out of their mouth. I'm not telling you not to listen to people. I'm not telling you to distrust everybody. What I'm telling you is that you're responsible for finding truth. You're responsible. You've got the Bible available to you. And you are supposed to check out what you hear with the Word of God, follow what's true, and reject what's not. Now, this doesn't mean you have to walk around as a skeptic all the time. There's an amicable way of doing this. I've got some preacher friends, even one just down the road right here. Uh, we get along. I love that man. I learned a lot from him. And, but I've been able to go to him, and I hear a sermon, and I say, look, your sermon said this. But in the Word of God, I see this. I disagree. So we sit there and talk about it, and we come to a conclusion. Oh, yeah. Sometimes I say, well, you're right. I didn't think about that. And sometimes he says, well, you're right. I didn't think about that. And we're still friends. We still love each other, and we still keep going. Just because somebody says something that isn't so doesn't mean you beat them down and bury them down. But you have to keep those red flags up. You have to stay on alert. You have to realize that only God can't lie. Only God can't lie. I don't care how scholarly they are, how educated they are, or how much money they're offering you. <laughs> Only God can't lie. Everybody understand that? And that goes for me too. Check out, check out everything that I say, especially if you come on Wednesday nights. You've heard this before. Don't just, don't just listen to what I say. You check out what I say. You go back and you study the Bible and compare it. And you take what's good and spit the rest out. Because you're, you're living for Jesus. You're not living for Brother Kevin. You're not living for any other person. You're not living for your Sunday school teacher. You're not living for Skyline Baptist Church. You're not living for the convention. You're not living for America. You're living for Jesus Christ. And that's the person you're going to have to answer to. And only God can't lie. And we go on. Verse 5. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather as we be slanderously reported, as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Let us do evil that good may come. Now I hear that all the time. As a Christian, especially as a Baptist, we understand eternal security because we're sealed by the Spirit till the day of redemption. Once you're in Jesus Christ, you can't get out. Some people call it once saved, always saved. It's called eternal security. It's called Bible doctrine. Once you're in the hand of God, nobody can pluck you out of His hand, but it's even better than that. You're part of the body of Christ. You're part of His hand. You're part of His body. You can't be pulled back out. And some people say that because you believe that, you're just going to go, you're safe in Christ, you're just going to go live like the devil. 
Anybody ever heard that before? Oh, you once saved, always saved people, you know. How do you, how, do you keep, how do you keep control over people? How do you keep your church members from going out and sinning if they don't think anything's going to send them to hell? So I'm not controlling anybody. <laughs> the Holy Ghost isn't controlling them. I sure can't. Somebody who's going to go live like they want to and just do whatever they want and live after the flesh, I'm not so sure they're saved in the first place. I'm not saying they're not. I'm just not so sure of it. I'm not going to bank my money on it. But that is not how a Christian is supposed to live. In Romans 6.1 it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid! How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Let me ask you a question. Are you dead to sin? Or are you wallowing in it? Loving it? Enjoying it? You know, sometimes we get... Sometimes we fool ourselves as Christians, you know? We know that we shouldn't sin, so we pretend that we don't like it. You got to admit to yourself that you like sin. And you're probably not going to overcome your most favorite sin until you admit that you like it. Sin is pleasurable. What's the rest of the verse? For a season. For a season. Sin is pleasurable for a season. A lot of young people go out and sow wild oats. What happens when you sow things? You reap. And so what people do is they go sow their wild oats and they spend the rest of their life trying to do good works to make up for it, praying for a crop failure. <laughs> but it rains on the just and on the unjust, and what you've sown, you will reap. Galatians 6. You know, you, people, some people say you send your ships out. One day they're going to come back and you're going to have to unload them. That's why, that's why it's good. Young people, listen closely, young people. You need to make some good friends with some older folks. You need to make some good friends with some older folks. Some of the older folks in this room and elsewhere, they have done the things you want to do. The things that you think are a good idea... Some of the older folks know it's not a good idea. They know it's not. <laughs> Amen. And if, if you don't heed their counsel, I don't know what to say about that. I don't want to call you stupid, but <laughs> if you don't heed the counsel of the older, wiser generation who has already traveled the path before you, you're going to pay some prices that you don't have to pay. You better find out what kind of oats that you need to sow for the harvest that you want to reap later. Because you will reap what you sow. So even a sinful man, even a sinful man who doesn't understand God can understand some things. He can understand that he reaps what he sows. If you look again, in verse 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seek after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're all together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Why don't you keep your hands there? Keep your finger right there in your Bible. And uh, go to Psalms. Psalm. The book of Psalms and Psalm number. Oh, we'll go to 14. See what we find there. Say amen when you get there. All right, that's most people. I, I like hearing the sound of pages turning. I do. I like, I like to, not too much now. <laughs> I like people bringing their Bibles to church because they want to they wanna see what God said. That, that tells me that there's, there's, a, there's a prospect of hope and health for some Christian people, spiritually. Psalm chapter 14, verse 1, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. You notice the fool says that where? In his heart. It's not an intellectual thing. You know, one of the most honest atheists I ever saw, if you ever saw Penn and Teller, which I can't recommend, <laughs> but he came on the Glenn Beck show one time, and he said, I'm not an atheist for intellectual reasons. I'm not an atheist for scientific reasons. I'm an atheist for philosophical reasons. I have decided to believe there's no God. 
That's an honest atheist. He has decided in his heart there's no God. And people have all kinds of reasons for espousing atheism, but really it's a heart problem. People don't like accountability. They don't like having to answer to somebody one day that's going to hold them accountable for the things they want to do but shouldn't do. And the fool, the fool, will pretend that there's no one to answer to and he'll say in his heart there's no God. But you know what? One day Sunday is going to come and he's going to get a surprise. And he's going to be standing before him. The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. This is what he's quoting in Romans 3. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge? Who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord? Now you'll find something similar to that, real similar to that, in Psalm 53. We won't look at it today, but go back to Romans 3. Knowledge and understanding. There's no knowledge, there's no understanding. In the book of Acts chapter 10, you have a guy named Cornelius. Now, if you're in Romans 3, look down at verse 18. It says there's no fear of God before their eyes. No fear of God before their eyes. But in Acts chapter 10, you have a, you have a man that is lost. His name is Cornelius. And in chapter 2, it says a man that feareth God with all his house. Well, how can a lost man fear God if Romans 3 says there's no fear of God before their eyes? There's a couple different ways it can be true. You see, a lost man is God-fearing without knowledge and without understanding. Now, we're saved by faith, right? By grace through faith. And faith cometh by and hearing by the Word of God. A lost man does not have the hearing of the Word of God, does not have faith. And his fear of God is a practical thing. In the eyes of other people, he looks like he fears God because he's religious. Because he's figured out that he's going to reap what he can sow. He's got some smarts about him. But in the eyes of God, it doesn't count for squat. Anything. Somebody liked that said squat back there. <laughs> it doesn't count for anything. Then there's the understanding. You have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. See, Cornelius feared God, feared God, but without knowledge. And men today, they fear God, but really they fear God for their own benefit. They may not feel, fear Jehovah God, but they fear some kind of God. They may fear karma. That's a selfish motive. I just don't want what goes around to come around back on me. I don't want to reap what I sow. You've got selfish motives. Some people sin for all sorts of reasons. Some people do good things just to prove their own self-righteousness to others in the eyes of other people. Some people do good things based on what they think or feel, not based on what God said. Some people do good things for fear of karma, for fear of punishment. Some people avoid sin because they can't afford it. Some people avoid sin because they're too feeble to enjoy the sin they used to enjoy. They're too weak and feeble. Their body can't handle it anymore. There's all kinds of reasons that people do good and don't sin in the eyes of men. I often wondered, I often wondered, what kind of sin we would get into if we had more opportunity to do it. See, some of us are in jobs, we have families, we have obligations, we have things to do, responsibilities. What if somebody stuck 10 million bucks in your pocket? What would you do then? See, some people don't sin just because they can't afford it. Some people don't sin just because they lack the opportunity. They would if they could, but they just can't right now because the opportunity isn't there. 
I went ahead and admitted this to God. I said, God, I want to admit to you right now I'm a dirty, rotten, wicked sinner, and if I could sin, I would. Under the right circumstances, I will fall. And I ask you not to put me in those circumstances. And I thank you for keeping me out of them. We need to be honest with ourselves. But Cornelius is a sinner. It looks like he fears God in the eyes of men, but he doesn't. You know in the book of James, it says if you offend in one place, you offend in all. If you offend in one place, you offend in all. In the Old Testament, sometimes they would go sacrifice a spotless lamb. And you'd have over here all the lambs with all the spots and freckles on them. And then you're just looking for that one lamb that's spotless. And you know, if you get that one lamb and he's got one spot on him, he's got to go over here with all the lambs that got covered in freckles and spots. Just one. If you offend in one place, no matter how good you are with the rest of your life, if you break the law just one place, one time, you're just as bad as somebody who broke the entire law. Because God is holy. God cannot countenance sin. He cannot sustain the presence of sin because he is holy. And some people think their good works are going to outweigh their bad works. Well, you don't understand. I've done all these good things. I mean, imagine you're going to stand before the judge here on earth. You're going to stand before the judge, and you've lived a perfect life, and you only killed one person. You're going to go to jail for murder because you've done that. All that other stuff doesn't matter. You still broke the law. Now that's just a human judge. That's just a human judge. If you tell a lie, there's different consequences for it. If you tell a lie to your kids, you're probably going to ruin your relationship with them. But life will go on. If you tell a lie to your wife, you'll probably ruin your relationship with her. Life will go on. It'll be tougher, but it'll still go on. If you tell a lie to your boss, you're going to lose your job. If you tell a lie to the IRS, you're going to go to jail. Same sin. The same sin. Just telling a lie. Now what do you think is going to happen if you tell a lie to God? You see, the nature of the sin isn't the case, isn't the problem in so much as the person that we're sinning against. The level of seriousness of our sin is infinite because God is infinite and the price that must be paid is all-encompassing and innocent. And there's only one way that that price can be paid. So there's no, there's no understanding, there's no knowledge. I've told you before, pray for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Knowledge is understanding facts, things that are true. Wisdom is understanding how those facts interoperate. And understanding, biblically, is knowing all those things in their relationship to God. A lost person can have a lot of knowledge about things, they can have a lot of wisdom about things down here under the sun. But when it comes to those things, relationship to God, and especially their own relationship to God, the only knowledge that matters is going to come out of this book. And they can, they can search for it all night long with a flashlight. And if they're not looking in this book, they're not going to find it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The understanding that gets a person saved, the knowledge that gets a person saved, the wisdom that gets a person saved comes out of the transformative power of this book. You're born again by incorruptible seed, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 1 Peter 1.23. And if you seek it any other way, like Cornelius did, you're going to die and go to hell. You see, Cornelius got saved in Acts 10.44. He was a good man, he gave alms, he prayed always, and one that feared God with all his house, and he was on his way to hell. And he was on his way to hell from Acts chapter 10, verse 1, all the way to Acts chapter 10, verse 43. And if he would have died in any of those verses, he would have died and gone to hell. 
no matter how religious he was. And that's the state of a lost man. If you offend in one place, you're just like that lamb that's got the spot. You might as well have offended in all places. The fear of God doesn't count. The almsgiving doesn't count. The prayer doesn't count. The religiousness doesn't count. The only thing that counts is the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, we think there's bad people and there's good people, and if you get saved, you become a good person. Well, I hope that Christ transforms you and... Uh, sanctifies you practically as you live your Christian life, but really, when you're saved, you're still basically bad. You still have this old man. You still have this old nature that still wants to sin. It's only by the power of God that you can be saved to begin with, and it's only by the power of God that you can overcome your sin every single day. That power does not lie within you unless you're saved, and the Holy Ghost within you gives you the power to overcome. That's the only way. The only way. Verse 18, there's no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know what's, what things soever. I don't want to apologize earlier. I realize I said some words that aren't in the text. And I don't mean to do that. I get dysgraphia sometimes. I believe that every, every word of God is pure. <laughs> but I added some words and left some words out. I didn't mean to do that. But sometimes that happens. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. You know, people think up all kinds of answers. I'm going to stand before God. I know what I'm going to say. I got this really good reason over here. God's not going to have any trouble with you. Your cynicism and your smart aleck tendencies aren't going to get past Jesus Christ. He can deal with Satan. He can deal with you. All the world will become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. What are the next three words? In his sight. I want to show you something. I want you to put your finger there in, chapter tw in verse 20. I want you to turn to James. Turn to James. Turn to James. James is toward the end of your New Testament. It's after the book of Hebrews. When we used to sing the song when I was a kid, it goes, Hebrews, James. And I didn't realize it was a book. I thought somebody was bruising James. I really did. <laughs> I really did. James chapter 2, keep your finger in Romans 3. Verse 18. In verse 17 it says, Even so faith, if it have not works, is dead being alone. I want you to look at verse 24, James 2, 24. It's kind of a frightening passage for somebody who believes that you can't be saved by works, which is what we believe here. You see then how that, in verse 24, James 2, 24, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. It's kind of frightening. Well, I thought we weren't justified. But we had just read a verse over here in chapter 20, in 320, Romans 3, 20. There shall no flesh be justified in his sight by the, work, by the deeds of the law. What gives? Look at verse 18. James 2, 18. Yea, a man say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show, what? Me. Thy faith without thy works, and I will show, what? Thee. Thee my faith by my works. Romans 3, 20 is in the sight of who? Man. Man. No. Romans 3.20. There you go. Pay attention. Romans 3.20 is in the sight of God. James 3.18 is in the sight of who? That's in the sight of man. Big difference, isn't it? You see the word justified, anybody who uses a computer and a word processing program, you understand what justified means. It means to line it all up and make it straight. You can have left, left justified. You can have right justified. You can have center justified. You can have justified, where both sides are lined up. Justified means to align. In the eyes of men, to be justified is that your profession matches in their eyes what you profess. Hey, I'm a Christian. That means your actions match that. You do what a Christian should do, and they can see it. It's a good testimony. That's what that is. But in Romans 3, we're dealing with something entirely different. See, you can fool people. And you can make them think you're religious and think that your actions match your profession of being a Christian. But God knows. And it is in the eyes of God that we have to do. 
It is in the eyes of God that we must be justified. We must align straight up with the law in the eyes of God, not in the eyes of men. Now we've got a serious problem there because nobody can do that. Nobody can be justified in the eyes of God by themselves. That's where Jesus Christ comes in to make that possible. If you don't get justified, aligned with the law of God Almighty, you're going to go to hell. And you can't do it yourself. Only one person that can do that for you. So verse 20 says, Therefore by the deeds of the law, back in Romans 3, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, Unto all and upon all that believe, there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Some lambs may have lots of spots, some may only have one. They all fall short of the glory of God. There's only one way to become spotless. Back in New York in the 1950s, there was a certain police squad where you had to be six feet to be on it. And if you weren't six feet, you couldn't be on that police squad. And some people tried out for it, and they were 5'11", 5'11 and a half. You didn't cut it. You fall short. Doesn't matter how close you come. There is no close enough. You either make the standard or you don't. And what we find out here is that everybody falls short of the standard. Then we have something great here. Being justified freely. Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. There's that word freely again. We got man's sin problem in Genesis with that word freely. And now we have man's sin cure coming up in Romans with this word freely. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 talks about this freeness. It's a gift. For by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is a free thing. God tries to give you eternal life and you try to work for it, it isn't going to help. You just have to receive it. You just have to receive the gift. What if somebody gave you a Lexus? A car. Somebody gave you a Lexus. And uh, you tried to pay them back by mowing their yard. Oh, I want to pay for it. Let me mow your yard. <laughs> it just wouldn't measure up. There's nothing you can do to pay God for eternal life. Nothing you can do. The price is too high. It's incalculable. It is universal. It is cosmological. It is above and beyond anything we can think or imagine. Which is why Jesus Christ had to pay the price. Being justified freely, verse 24, by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ. The redemption is the price of Jesus Christ's blood that pays for your sins so you can once again be his instead of a child of wrath. As Ephesians 2 says we were before we were saved. Verse 25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation. There's a big word, huh? That means the atoning victim. Imagine you're on death row and you're going you're gonna to be put in the electric chair. I think Texas still does that. And then all of a sudden, you're guilty. You know you deserve the electric chair. But somebody else steps up, somebody who committed no crime, and they say, let this person go. I'll take their place. That's a propitiation. That's what Jesus Christ did for us. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Now I want to read something to you and I want you to listen very carefully. Some people look at that passage and they say the remission of sins that are past, well that just means that I'm cured from the sins I've already committed. What about the ones I'm going to commit? That's not what it's talking about. You know, this is the transition between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Life under the law and then life in the body of Christ, which is what we're now in, and things change. And under the law, if the blood of Jesus Christ is the only thing that can pay for sins, what about all those people from Adam through John the Baptist? What about them? It's going to pay for their sins. Well, they could be forgiven... But they couldn't be redeemed until Jesus Christ showed up. Because Jesus Christ's blood is the only thing that can redeem sins. So in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, it says, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death 
for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. See, the sins that are past are the ones that have been being committed by mankind for 4,000 years. Jesus Christ showed up as a propitiation for the whole world. The sins of the whole world. Not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 2, 2 says... So the sins that are past is not a reference to your sins that you've already committed. It's a reference to mankind's sins that were committed before Jesus Christ showed up. They were under the first testament for Israel under the law. To declare, verse 26, I say at this time, his righteousness. Now what's your righteousness going to get you? Where are you going to wind up if your own righteousness is the only thing representing you? Louder? Hell, hell, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness. Now, I want you to stay in Romans, but I want you to turn to chapter 10. His righteousness. His righteousness. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record... That they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. they got the same problem Cornelius had. They want to do right, but they're not doing it according to the word of God. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And if you want to be saved, you need the righteousness of God. Verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You say, well, how do I get that righteousness? Stay in chapter 10 look down. Look at verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, even in thy heart. That, that is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, can God lie? No. No, if God says you're saved, you're saved. You confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's how you get Christ's righteousness. That's how you receive Christ. That's how you trust Christ. That's where the rubber meets the road. Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Back in chapter 3, back in chapter 3, if you've never trusted Christ before, Romans 10, 9, and 10 that we just looked at, that's how you trust Christ. Jesus Christ died for you. He was buried, shed his blood. He rose again the third day. Put your faith and trust in him. His sacrifice pays for your sins, and you don't have to. If you pay for your own sins, you're going to do it in hell for all eternity for the sins committed against God Almighty. Verse 27, 327, where is boasting then it is excluded? By what law of works? Nay, but of the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Aren't you glad you don't have to keep the law to be saved? We'd have a time of it, wouldn't we? That's what the discussion's about in Acts chapter 15. How can we put a yoke on the Gentiles which neither we nor our fathers were able to bear? We don't have that yoke. Our salvation is freely given as a gift. It's freely given as a gift. Is he the God of the Jews only? Verse 29. Is he not also the God... Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. That's us too. It's good news, by the way. <laughs> good news. He's our God too. You see, if you, if you look through the book of Acts, Acts eleven nineteen, it says they went around preaching to Jews only. They didn't think Gentiles could get saved until Acts eleven eighteen. They didn't think we could. I'm glad we can. I'm glad we can. Verse 30, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith, those are Jews and Gentiles, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Some people say, well, I'm a Christian. I don't have to follow the law. I don't have to follow the law. You don't have to follow the law to be saved. That's true. You can't follow the law. But in order to be saved, you have to recognize that the law is good. The law 
the law being the first five books of the Bible, Exodus, Leviticus, all the rules and regulations, the law is good. It is from God. And somebody, Jesus Christ, somebody had to keep the whole law so that I could be saved. And when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, what you're saying ultimately is that, God, I do recognize that your law is good, it is righteous, it is holy, it is pure, but I can't keep it. But I want to put my faith and trust in someone who did, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ kept the entire law. He didn't err in one single place. And for you and me, when he didn't have to, he allowed himself to be sacrificed for us. And it didn't stop there. As horrible as the crucifixion was, the Bible says in Psalm chapter 16, verses 8 through 11, in Acts chapter 2, verse 27 and 21, that Christ went down into hell. His soul was made an offering for sin, Isaiah 53 says. He is the only person who can go to hell and of his own accord come back out. If you go, you'll stay. You better put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ before it's too late. And Christian, we don't just completely ignore. We say, oh, I'm, I'm a Christian. I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It means I can do whatever I want to. No. Not what your flesh wants to. When you trust Christ, you recognize that the law is good. I'm not trying to tell you to keep the entire Old Testament law because some of it doesn't necessarily apply right now because it's governmental. But we should want to please Jesus Christ in everything that we do. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. When you trust Christ, you recognize that he is good, holy, and pure, and that everything he is is what we should strive for through the power of the Spirit. Christian, if you're not living for Jesus Christ after all he did for you, make the change today. Commit to Jesus Christ today after everything he did for us, after all the law that he kept. Surely we can at least live by the Spirit. And perhaps there's somebody here who's never trusted Jesus Christ. If you haven't, God puts you here for a reason. God puts you here by his divine providence so that you could hear what the word of God says today about your sinful condition. If you don't trust Jesus Christ, you're going to die in your sin and there's no more hope. Jesus Christ is the only hope. Won't you please trust him today? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we know you're the only hope that we have. We thank you for your shed blood, Lord, as, as wicked and horrible as I am, Lord, you still died for me so that I could be with you. Lord, I pray that you would open the eyes of anyone who's not trusted you before, Lord. I pray that you would restrain the work of the devil who's working to darken the minds of them, lest they should hear the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would restrain any evil influence that may be hovering over someone's heart today, trying to prevent them from trusting you as Savior. And Lord, I pray that you would make it clear to them, illuminate them with your light. Lord, I pray that the hearing of the word of God today would bring faith in their hearts, Lord. And I pray that they'd trust you as his Savior. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.